Thanks, Daphne. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Andrew. I am um, in a, a new role, a new role that hasn't existed before, really, with the London region for NHS England Improvement as Autism Programme Development Lead. So building on uh, the national strategy and trying to go above and beyond that as we look at the programme and strategy uh, specific for London. But really, I'm here talking to you today because I am autistic myself. Uh, and like an increasing number of people, I didn't know that till later in life, not till in fact I hit the age at the grand old age of 40, uh, 10 years ago. Now I know what you're saying, 40 Andrew, surely not. But yes, sadly, uh, even though I know, I know, you know, all this moisturizer works, not at all. Um, but there's loads of us now being recognized later in life. And quite often, I think, adults being recognized as autistic whilst they're watching their children go through that identification process. And as parents are watching their children go through it, little pennies, of course, drop for them. So, uh, ooh, uh, uh, ooh, oh, oh, ah, OK. And realising, of course, that just like me, they've been autistic all along, even if we didn't know it. Um, there's a few more of you on the call than the last one. Uh, so I don't think we'll have a chance to go th and through you all one bar, which is a shame because it's always nice to, to see people's faces and get a wave. But I wonder, and especially in this weird new online world that we, we work in, I notice people are that much shyer about unmuting and shouting things out. But I wonder if we could start with this. I tell you what, let, let, let's try and do a speed run. I hope you're OK with this. I, I, would you mind if I picked on you just one by one as you appear in my list? And just as you just give us a wave, but um, just give me a word or one word that you would associate with the word autism. If I say autism to you, what pops into your head? And if any of you can name the person in the photograph, You'll, uh, I've already arranged with Daphne, we're going to send out a special chocolate brownie in the post. Not really uh, for any of you that can get the person in the photograph. So I've got I've got Ali on my list first. Mm. I thought it would be me. I'm that going to say. I know I, I. Yeah, I have an A word as well. I'm always okay. first. On those. <laughs> I'm going to say intriguing. Intriguing. OK, thank you, Ali. Uh, Daphne, did you want to chip in or are you sitting in the background? No, that's OK. Um, I was thinking more uh, ambiguity. Ooh. OK, do, do, forgive me, just do you want to expand on that a tiny bit? Um, I guess I was thinking in the line of the difficulties in diagnosis um, and what it actually means, um, because it's just starting to, um, you know, people are just starting to pay attention to it. So it's still ambiguous, and but um, I guess yeah. we're getting there. Thank you. Uh, Zoe. Hello, Zoe. Hello there. Um, the first word that came into my mind was um, being anxious. Mm. I, don't, I don't. Yeah, I suppose I'm a mental health nurse by background, so I suppose I've captured that through my experience. Yeah, well, I wouldn't disagree. It's pretty much a permanent feature of uh, my life and I think most of the autistic people I know. Yeah, I'd agree, Zoe. Thank you. Uh, do you know the person in the photograph? Is that, um, is it Dustin Hoffman? And in, in, I can't think of the film that he's in, but Rain I. Man. Yeah. Rain Man. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. do you remember the, do you want to hazard a guess, anyone, what year that film came out? Eighty something, eighty eight. Oh, get in. Absolutely spot on. Yeah, 1988. Or as I'm going to say, it was only 1988, a mere 33 years ago. Because I reckon that film was probably the first time most people had even heard the word autism. If it wasn't already in their family, or I'm going to correct myself already, if it wasn't already stereotypically in their family, um, only 33 years ago. We are nowhere with understanding autism. And I subtitle every talk I give on it, long or short, as the more we learn, the less we know. 
I think we are absolutely in that place, which is why I want today to try and bust as many myths as I have in the short time we have together uh, as possible as we move through. Zoe, thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Hello, sorry for my late response. Um, so I think it's increasing awareness. Two words, sorry. Oh, don't don't worry. We'll uh, we'll just tax you on the second one. Not to problem. Um, increasing. So we think we are we think we are getting better, Jennifer. Well, there have been in my area. There have been um, some sufficiency forecasting work done. And um, I think it's really making people sit up and think that actually the numbers are going to increase a lot in the next 10 years. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because be of better um, recognition, better, be better diagnosis. I don't know why, but it, it's made us sit up and think. Yeah. And it, of course, I think you raised that good question, isn't it? And I'm going to argue very strongly it is about better recognition. The numbers have always been the same. It's just that we're much better at identifying and recognising autism these days. Uh, as we stand here today, sorry, I'm all over the place already, aren't I, in this? But as we stand here today, a study from March 2021, so this year, of 7 million English school children showed us that currently one in 35 English school boys are diagnosed as autistic. Uh, much fewer girls, but it balances out to around 1.9% of the population. I'm going to argue there are just as many autistic girls as boys um, and that we are should be counting, which those figures start, I think, at least in the boys to, to, to prove, we should be counting at least 2.5% of the population as autistic which is what America counts. So, you know, I think we're starting to show that. Uh, Joe. Hello. Um, hello, I'm Joe. Um, I've um, one word that um, comes to mind um, first, uh, first is spectrum, um, because I see autism a, a, as a spectrum condition and, um, and, even, and I'm, I, I'm autistic myself. Um, and, and although we do share um, common similarities on similar themes, there is still quite a lot of variation and difference among, among autistic people. Brilliant. Thank you, Joe. Lovely. Uh, Kath. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Kath. Um, I guess the word uh, that first comes to mind when I think about autism is life. Life? Yeah. Oh, so for me, okay. um, as a parent and as an individual, it's just part of us. <laughs> it's not. Um, it's not about the system. It's a. It's about life, I guess. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got three more then, Michelle. Hi. Um, mine would be um, sadly hideous, having oh. um, a personal experience with my son um, and. Um, going through him going through mainstream and secondary and not being diagnosed etc um and not having the support um required so yeah but now very positive mm. very positive outcome doing extremely well now he's 21. yeah cool so you're relating the word hideous to the experience of being yeah. autistic yeah. not, not being autistic I'm sure. but now being more um having that increased awareness i wish retrospectively could have had that back then but hey but no but um very positive now having family and friends and people who supported through this has now turned out to be very positive so yes now he's age 21 so yeah but not particularly good experience so just a year younger than me that's lovely yeah yes yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh pamela Um, mine's a long word, but it's one word, multifaceted. Ah, but can you spell it? But no, just kidding. Um, yeah. yeah, multifaceted, <laughs> okay. And I think that links to, to what, uh, sorry, I didn't catch the name, but earlier chap was saying about the um, spectrum and the, the range of, you know, it's, it's not very much, not a simple uh, 
a simple condition is that it's there's lots to it, lots to individual profiles. Thank you, Pamela. And last but not least, Rima. Hello, um, I also think of spectrum when I think of autism. It's just about making sure that um, you're supporting um, the individual as an individual rather than bracketing sort of everyone with autism in the same um, sort of box and, you know, just making sure that everything's very person centred and right for that individual. Mm, mm, thank you. Thank you, Rima. So uh, thank you all for that. Um, you've been a slightly unusual group, but I'm not quite, I'm not surprised given what we've uh, where we've all come from today. And that usually, of course, when I do this, the words I hear back are, and, and I guess we've been sort of true today, are neutral at best. Generally negative, neutral at best, and very few actively positive words. And I think if we just bear that in mind, isn't it? We're in this very weird place of the more we learn, the less we know, that there's almost no research on autism. That's kind of true. The first ever bit of research published in the UK on the effects of the psychological effects of, of the sense of self of having a late life adult diagnosis was done in 2014 with a not very massive study of eight people, many of whom I knew. And indeed, if you've done autism training uh, in your time, and I'm sure you have, well, I'm going to, even a couple of years ago, I, I would lay two bets with you. The first bet is that even a couple of years ago, you'd probably have heard something quite different to what you'd hear today. And who knows what I'll be banging on about in a couple of years time, because we're seeing new research show us different things all the time. But the other bet I'd lay is that if you'd had that training, it almost certainly wasn't delivered by an autistic person. And I think that in and of itself is at the heart of some of the misunderstandings and problems and conversation that we still have about it. The fact that that is still seen as kind of OK and acceptable and normal and we, I very much hope, wouldn't accept that as OK and normal if we were talking about other minority groups. Where the majority speakers were not from those minority groups. So we are in this, I think, rather strange place where most of the conversation around autism. Is led by non autistic people. Um, let's build on that more we learn the less we know the tiny bit of history so, so autism as we've come to uh, as the thing we now understand it today we, we we start calling it the autism only less than 80 years ago during the second world war first identified really by two men working entirely separately from one another um, a chap called, I know, I, I know I'm going to pronounce these names wrong, but Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, probably much more famous Asperger, uh, both Austrian, but Kanner got out of there before the Nazis had properly taken over and went to America in the 1930s. And Kanner became very much the voice of autism, the go-to guy. He made quite the career out of it, out of having parents take their children along for diagnosis. And I say children because back then, and I would argue even today, the emphasis has always been on autism and children, rather forgetting that autistic children, of course, grow up into autistic adults. Mm -hmm. But Kanna either poo pooed other people's research or just stole it on the quiet and pretended it was his own, uh, put autism in a very tight, small, blinkered box, very kind of rigid criteria, and used very negative, uh, stigmatizing language about it. Asperger, on the other hand, well, to say he's controversial, I think, would be to be uh, overly polite about him. Uh, Asperger didn't leave Austria when the Nazis moved in, and it turns out, sadly, that he was a Nazi collaborator. He was a eugenicist. Uh, he was very much part of uh, the government schemes of doctors who decided which disabled children would live 
and which would be formally put to death by the government. And that's literally what happened, a checklist of doctors deciding which disabled children would be exterminated. And whilst Asperger did talk about, uh, in his words anyway, positives of autism, while he did save a few children uh, from, from extermination, uh, he quite happily sent others uh, to their deaths. So as I say, to consider him controversial, I think is already to be quite uh, polite uh, about the man. But if we think that of these two men, upon, whom, upon whose work most of our modern understanding is still, and I'm going to say quite unhelpfully, still largely based, and that one of those whole bodies of work didn't come to light until 1981, you can see, I think, why I keep my subtitle of the more we learn, the less we know. Asperger's work was only translated into English in 1981, uh, and only then by accident because of uh, the work of, of, of Lorna Wing here. Lorna and Judy Gould are the two founders of the National Autistic Society and between them are responsible for a lot of the words and phrases that we now associate with autism, that they invented the term Asperger's syndrome. They came up with the concept of spectrum. Uh, you might have heard of the triad of impairments, of course, now an outdated uh, diagnostic tool. Um, and we are in that very strange place today, aren't we? Where we know that the diagnostic criteria in America changed some years ago, what would that be, eight years ago, with the DSM-5 coming out. But as we sit here today, the delayed ICD that we use in Europe and the UK will only come out, or rather start to come into force on January the 1st, 2022, a delay of, I think, about 18 months, again, because of um, that little thing called COVID. I don't know, you know, I don't know if you heard of COVID. It's a small thing that happened, got in the way. So that means we're in a very, very strange place at the moment, doesn't it? Because clinicians, for some time, it's rather depended who was sitting in front of you as to where they base their, what they base their diagnosis on. Were they sticking strictly to the thing that they you know, that was currently in force, or were they preempting what they knew was coming but didn't quite know when? And we'll see, quite, I think, uh, quite a wide variation amongst even clinicians on, on how they're basing their diagnosis. But may I, may I throw this back to you? And you've been lovely at that chipping in. I'm so grateful. Just in terms of autism, do you know what these initials stand for? ASC, ASD, AS and HFA. Oh, just shout out, Ali, don't worry. Very kind of you to pop a hand up. But I think it's, it's an autistic Autism spectrum condition, autism spectrum disorder, but you could say autism or autistic, AS Asperger's syndrome or Asperger's, depending on how you say it, and HFA is high functioning autism. Get in, spot on. And you're quite right. I, I know it should be Asperger, but uh, I'm afraid I make this joke all the time, but it's true. I, I can't get the image out of my head that I've just made the wrong order at McDonald's. So I'm afraid. <laughs> I'll have an Asperger, but I, mean, I can't get it out of my head. So I'm afraid I say it incorrectly as Asperger's. <laughs> Otherwise, I, you know, get distracted by thinking about what sauce you'd have with an Asperger. I mean, ugh. Uh, you're quite right. But with our new criteria, these terms disappear. In fact, high functioning autism uh, was never a, a diagnosis anyway. It was just a term we've banded around. And as I hope to explain uh, in, in the second half of this session, a phrase I'd like to never hear again and ban immediately, because I think using phrases like high functioning underpins a really problematic misunderstanding of autism. But everything is just autism. Asperger's disappears, and again, I think that is a good thing. Because historically, Asperger's only exists because of that man Canna, because of the tight blinkered box he put autism into and the massive influence he had over the industry, and because of the stigma he created around it. So because so many people were either just missing out because of the tight uh, criteria he created, 
or they were so unwilling to get that label of autism because of the stigma and the language. Lorna invented the term Asperger's to take the word autism out of autism. Just to try and remove the stigma and association, but Asperger's never was, never has been anything other than just autism by a different name. And so to remove it, I think is really helpful because to the lay person, I think otherwise you think of Asperger's somehow over here. It's a type of autism, a subtype, a kind of, what does that mean? And I think for far too long, we've been pathologizing personality. I don't think there are subtypes of autism. I think there are subtypes of personality, of people. We are all different people. We are as varied from each other as autistic people as non-autistic people are. And indeed that word spectrum created by Lorna was in her own words designed to show that. I think again, unfortunately, some people have looked at the word spectrum and thought of it as a line. We've ended up with people talking about high functioning, uh, you know, whispering low functioning because that's a bit rude, but kind of we know what we're saying mild autism, severe autism. She never meant it to be a line. She meant it just to show that variety of, of colours, of backgrounds, multifaceted, as, as is it, uh, Pamela said earlier, just as much for autistic folk as for non-autistic folk. So yeah, I'm very pleased that everything is just being called autism because I think it starts that journey towards better understanding us as people um, with as a variety of, of background skills and personalities as anyone else. But I, but I think the biggest change of all is a cultural one. That for the first time in the last few years, autistic people have started to form as a community. There are various hashtags some of us gather on that you'll see on social media, like actually autistic and things like that. And I think just like any other community, the conversation has moved on to language. We've seen that, of course, with other groups in the past, haven't we? Reclaiming words or, or whatever. And I wonder if I could throw it back to you then again. And uh, please, there's no right or wrong here. This is just your gut feeling. How should we talk about autism? Do any of these phrases sit better with you than others? A person first language, am I an autistic person? Do I have it, live with it? Kath, what do you think? Um, for me, I, I feel it's a bit like the Black Lives Matter conversation. It should be informed by the autistic community. So when my son was young, um, the kind of current um, very forward thinking rights based stuff said, you know, it's with autism, the more than just the autism. So I always said, you know, he had autism and stuff. And I guess the way I describe it to parents is is it's the same as the Black Lives Matter conversation. I don't just Black Lives Matter, but that those communities that have been more disempowered by the language should choose the language and that should change and keep changing as those conversations go on, I guess. So I guess my answer is I, I don't think I have set language. I think it alters and I'll go, I'll hear something. And if I hear it enough from groups of people who are autistic, like I hear, please don't say with autism, say autistic. That doesn't mean everybody is in agreement, um, but, but that those groups talking about it will inform that language as we move forward. I, I'd agree, Kath, isn't it? I, I think fundamentally, and, and I guess I don't need to tell any of you this, but fundamentally we'd want to mirror the language the person in front of us is using themselves. But I, but I would just highlight how often, even in my position, um, firstly with councils as autism leads now with this, you know, a, a, we've titled this an NHS senior manager, which makes me feel like a bit of a toss of saying that, but you know, bit of, you'd be surprised how many people sit in meetings with me f knowing full well I'm autistic. It's not something, it's something I blurt at every given moment uh, and, and don't do that with me. I'll be sitting there talking about myself one way and everyone else or a number of people will choose to use other language. I often wonder, is there a point at which I'm allowed to start saying, uh, hang on a minute, <laughs> you know, I, I'm starting, you know, hello. Uh, but that said, I, I think if there's a default to option, 
it's now autistic person. That in surveys that go out, an ever increasing majority, in fact, it's now a very, very large majority of autistic people prefer to be called just that, as do I. Um, but acknowledging, as Kath says, not everyone agrees. Uh, I prefer to be called autistic. I don't have it. I don't live with it. You know, I live with my cat and my partner. I don't take my shopping with me when I go out on a weekend. Uh, autism is not a shell I live inside. There's no non-autistic Andrew inside me struggling to get out. If I wasn't autistic, I wouldn't be Andrew. I would be someone else. And I don't want a cure for being who I am. Thank you very much. I rather like the way an autistic psychiatrist put it, who describes herself as having anorexia. She said, I am autistic because that's a friend to be made. That's who I am. But I have anorexia because that's a bully to be beaten. That's something I don't want. And, and if I were, if I may, if I said something which I know will sound offensive, but that's the point. If I were to sit here talking about people having gayness, or living with gayness, or a person with gayness. I mean, I can see the faces I'm already getting a bit tight-lipped, or what, 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 no, what, what, what's that? Our little radars have gone up. No, that sounds wrong, because it does, doesn't it? It just sounds fundamentally no, because somewhere in our heads we know that means we think being gay is wrong, or a fault. That language indicates that to us, and that's how I hear being referred to as a person with autism. I'm also a dad. It's not all of my life. I have a life outside being a dad, but it's fundamental to my life. I wouldn't say I'm a person with dadness. A person with dadity. I don't know. Maybe we, should, we could play with that a bit, can we? So yes, for me, I am autistic. And I think it is important, whatever one's own views, I think one has to recognise language is a bit of a hot potato for the community at the moment and getting it wrong can lead to some real genuine, you know, offence being taken. What I would note, especially as we're talking about a CYP perspective, is that parents still vote the other way. Parents still vote in those surveys for their children to be referred to as a child with autism. And I, I, I'm very sorry to hear, you know, when I hear these things, because there does still seem to be, I think, as I started by saying, in, in, in a conversation that is still largely led by non-autistic people, I think it's a shame that parents are still voting a different way from the adult autistic community, because that's exactly who, of course, their children once were uh, and will be in the future. But yeah, so I think language does does matter. Um, oh, sorry, go on, Kath. I, I was just going to say, do you, do you hope or think that might change as training is delivered a little um, differently now? Because I, I still see families who use the term Asperger's when I think that's like, I don't know, I'd, I'd say a good 15 years since it's been used in diagnostic across the country. But we still see that when because that's your first introduction to it. And hopefully that will change as training and diagnosis is a little um, more respectful. Yeah, yeah well, I, could, I mean, just factually, Kath, it, it only stopped being a diagnosis in 2013 in the DSM, but it yeah. still is, you know, until January, officially a diagnosis in the UK, yeah. although you're unlikely to get one, as I say, because clinicians preempt that. Uh, but I think the, the ASPE community, uh, some, some, I mean, I mean, I, I would never want to be associated with, with just the, the, the name of a known Nazi, uh, regardless of anything else I've said today. Um, I think some people do still hang on to it a bit, but I would suggest that's largely because of the stigma they still perceive around the word autism, largely because people still think of it as, well, let, let's segue into this true or false, still think of it as a learning disability. And of course, autism isn't a learning disability. Uh, Daphne, I'm so sorry. My, my, can you just remind me what time we, we, we're finishing to, just before I launch into this? We have 10 more minutes. 10 minutes. There we go. Thank you. And I think we've made a couple of really big mistakes, here, haven't we? Which again, I think, hark back to language a little bit. It wasn't that long ago, single figure years, that we talked about 
about half of autistic people also uh, being learning disabled. Our latest statistics show us that that's actually a proportion of 85% to 15%. Uh, there's a suggestion, uh, and, and you know, watch this space, is that in fact we will find out that learning disability is no more prevalent in autism than it is in, in the typical population. You're no more likely to be learning disabled if you're autistic than if you're not. We, we also have that study, of course, as I, as I uh, of, of showing that, that that seven million school children study from March 2021 showing that we currently have one in 35 English school boys as autistic, but, you know, uh, around two and a half percent, which I think again is, is a figure we should be working on. We, we massively undercount autistic people, but however you slice it, the vast majority of autistic people uh, are not people with learning disabilities. So we've done two things here, haven't we? I, I think we've looked at someone who's also learning disabled and we've called them severely autistic. And we've looked at someone who isn't and we've called them mild or high functioning. Well, I'm going to suggest that's just factually incorrect, apart from being super unhelpful. Because that's a bit like measuring diabetes by cancer. If, if, if you're a diabetic and have cancer, we wouldn't call that person severely diabetic. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Now, don't get me wrong, they've got two things going on in their life at the same time. Sure, they may well have more immediate day to day needs, but one does not measure the other. And I'm no doctor. Perhaps there is a correlation. Perhaps if you're diabetic, you're more prone to cancer. I've no idea. But even if that's true, we don't measure one by the other and we shouldn't be doing that between autism and learning disability. And I think the reason I have a job in this new post is because the system is beginning to realise we shouldn't really have been separating LD and autism into a single box in the first place. That in itself is quite problematic, isn't it? But secondly, and unfortunately, I've got to give you some rather unpleasant figures here. We've been measuring a happy autistic life by the wrong yardstick in the first place. That we've looked at someone who you might have labelled high functioning, hopefully in the past, not in the future. Someone who measured up as being quite close to looking or behaving neurotypically. And we've said two things. Well, firstly, that must mean you're mildly autistic. Well, I hope I've shown why that's a bit of a nonsense. You know, autistic people are as wide and varied in IQ or otherwise or skills as anyone else. We don't label neurotypicals as high functioning. That's just their personality. But also evidentially, I think it's really dangerous. Because what we know is that the act of trying to measure up to this ruler that might look like success to a neurotypical parent even, but actually is just encouraging masking and camouflaging. We know that autistic people without a learning disability are the most likely single cohort of people to die by suicide. There is no one more likely to kill themselves than me. And my first suicide attempt was at 14. I do not think I know any, certainly not many, autistic people, and I know lots of us, who don't have a suicide story. Or should I say those of us still here to tell it? Because of course, sadly, an attempt doesn't always end at as an attempt. We are nine times more likely to kill ourselves than anyone else. The only other group up there with us might be the trans community, but the data set on that is still a bit too small to prove. But we do have some new data from last year, a, a meta analysis, so a study of studies uh, that shows that if you're trans, you are between three to six times more likely to be autistic in the first place out of interest. But here's the real kicker. There is a proven, evidenced, researched, direct correlation between masking and camouflaging and killing yourself. 
So in other words, the very people we've been most likely to miss because we called them high functioning, because parents at a young age have seen that, sometimes been trained to see that as a good thing. That little Johnny is now sitting at table, that little Johnny has stopped screaming and is able to put up with the noise. Little Johnny is not able to put up with the noise. He's never going to be able to put up with the noise. All he can do is pretend he's not, he's able to. Wearing that mask, little Johnny kills himself 20 years later. Which is why I think words like high functioning are so unhelpful because they just cement that misunderstanding. They just cement that this is the right yardstick to measure us against. And a happy, successful autistic life does not necessarily look anything like a happy, successful neurotypical life. So if there's one myth I'd like to bust today, I think that is the big one. If there's one thing I'd like to advocate for, it's changing the language, changing the way we think about autistic folk. It is the don't, again, don't get me wrong, folk, you know, if if little John is biting mummy, that's terrible. Sure, that's not great for Johnny and terrible for mummy. But let's not stop little Johnny biting. Let's ask little Johnny to bite something else instead. Let's do what I've done, which is take people around pet shops and get people to literally bite dog toys. Because if you do, if you bite the knuckle of your finger compared to the fat of your finger, that feels fundamentally different. It's not even getting a dog toy, it's getting the one that feels nicest. There's a fundamental difference in there. Been trying to stop someone doing the thing that feels good, but doing it in a healthy way, not so in a way that's bad for mummy. It's not trying to stop the autistic person being autistic. It's just trying to find a nice, safe, happy space for an autistic person to be in. And I'll leave you with this one final thought. I know we have a couple of minutes for questions. We are in a strange place, aren't we? Because even getting a diagnosis, we had a paediatrician on the line before and we, the penny was dropping with, with her too. If you are a happy autistic person, happy autistic child, you won't get a diagnosis. The whole process is still couched in deficit. If you've made those accommodations, we live in a world where all our language, even the process of being recognised, still depends on you being miserable. And I long and hope and pray to bust the myths that leave us in that place. I'll shut up now. Uh, Kath, go on. And anyone uh, else? I just wanted to, to add that I think that's the same for um, adults and particularly women, that it's all on a deficit model. So if you if you say, look, I think I am autistic, they will say, how is that affecting your life? But they don't ask how you might have shaped your life. And I think that's really crucial for helping any adult. I think sometimes when we see parents, it's actually would be more helpful for the diagnosis to sit with them sometimes. But we see it as such a well, they're fine, they hold a job down there for they couldn't possibly, which is just, I, I agree, it's nonsense. And just like to thank you for your conversation today. It's been really thought provoking. Uh, pleasure. And I'm, I see another hand. I know time is ticking, but just real quick, two absolutely real, I know this, this is about adults now, but two real stories from last year of GPs refusing to make a referral because the person was married and the person had a job. Now, if that's the world we're living in, where some GPs still misunderstand autism so badly that apparently I can't have a yeah you know, I can't have a job or ever have a partner, then we have a problem, don't we? Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm hovering over your photo. We well, got your hand up, but I can't see your name anymore. Is it Zoe? Is that right from memory? I'm Siobhan. I had my hand. Siobhan, up. sorry. Hello. I didn't realise my name. My name wasn't there. I was a bit late. So I just found that really interesting. Siobhan, yeah. really, really interesting, and um. I guess I just wanted to ask a question about the diagnosis because I, I, I'm really not an autism expert. I'm a commissioner who is we're trying to address our autism pathways. And one of the things uh, I have often wondered is around the importance of the diagnosis. And I think obviously if people and adults want a diagnosis, we should have services there so they can. But 
do you think we should be moving away from a diagnosis led service provision and it should be more about the need of the child so then it doesn't matter what their diagnosis is or or is is the diagnosis actually very important um i guess that's what i'm trying to grapple with really because ideally i think we'd want needs led and not diagnosis led services I mean, I, I, that's a huge question, isn't it? And, and time's a bit short. I mean, ultimately, it should all be about someone's needs. Uh, I, I don't think we live in that world yet. Mm. Uh, you still need a label to get certain services. Uh, I hope to be able to change how we understand the label and still see that that person has this wide variety of people behind one. Um, and I think there's something about a label that can help us form a, as a community. You know, I think at the moment, again, it's quite helpful. I, I, I'm quite proud of being autistic. I like that. I can, I can you know, I have a, a clan, a, a team, a gang. You know, I belong somewhere. Um, but so long as we understand autism as a, you know, not just this, but this, um, then I think we're we're heading in the right direction. Um, not the, I, I do think services, when we commission services, we need to bear in mind the long waiting lists. I think you need to commission services that are accessible to people who are seeking a diagnosis. And I'd like to say, although it's hard for commissioners, I know, if you allowed people who self-identify as autistic to attend to, on the basis that, you know, if a GP is rejecting a referral because someone's got a job, Oh dear, you know, and yet we know with the suicide rates. Be, I mean, we, we, anecdotal evidence in Northwest London is about a quarter of inpatient admissions for autistic people since January, but fewer than half of those were diagnosed as autistic. On that alone, you know, we need to, I think, be uh, allowing people to access specialist services. We've gone over, haven't we, Daphne? Sorry, I see you sort of looking a bit anxious in the. No, that's OK. This up. is this is the end of the event, so we don't have I don't have anywhere to get to. Um, oh, is, did the people not reconvene? No, we don't have. Oh, to, OK, so oh, this is where we case, end. Yeah, feel um, free. I do have one ask from you guys to I've put a link to the evaluation form in the chat, so please, please take a couple of seconds to fill that out. It's very important for us and for DFE as well. Um, other than that, thank you, Andrew, for this amazing uh, presentation. I loved it, I'm sure. Uh, we've got some great feedback in the chat as well. Um, yeah, if you need anything regarding the event, feel free to email me or Marie. Um, Andrew just put, in, put his email address as well if you need his contact information. But overall, thank you for coming and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. And that Dead serious. It's, uh, I, you know, I do have this job in London. So if you're in London region and want to talk about working together on the London strategy, then, uh, and of course, if you want to just talk personally, that's you're also very welcome. Thank you. Take care, everybody. That's great. Thank you very much. It's really, yeah, really interesting. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Daphne. Thank you, Andrew. Bye.